and welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Satello Esquire and the wrestling dentist, Mike Leno. Good to see you. Good to see you tonight. Well, we did try. Evan did. uh, He probably had something come up, some emergency. We had him all scheduled, so he will come back. So I'm sure he's going to watch this uh, when it gets posted. And Ev, so we hope to have you back next week. Saturday and we hope he's not dead or anything like that folks uh, don't don't think that we we it's public cut him up and stuffed him in a box somewhere we hope his publisher also has been a a little under the weather Jeff Archer in San Diego who's a great guy do you Uh, you remember clutch cargo of course and also the associated cartoon there was Clutch Cargo and there's Diver Dan. That was the second that was produced by the same outfit. And it was and a, what we could do is we could have Evan's face on the screen, but just animated, le- you know, let's say, hi, 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 I'm Evan Ginsburg. Particularly Clutch Cargo, it was like they had the cartoon, but there wasn't really any movement. So it was really the cheapest cartoon, but they had human lips. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. We could do that for Evan. We could. It, it's, yeah. it's, it was the craziest thing but do you remember the the uh, diver dan show that was that was uh, made by i the- do not i cl- cl- the only thing that was and for me it was when uh, uh channel two used to have the uh, afternoon cartoon show you know when i was a kid they would run the clutch cargo stuff and then when cartoon when the cartoon network first started because they were so broke remember they had they, they were the cartoon network had absolutely nothing that they it was uh 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 I think it was uh, first. Actually, no, it was Comedy Central when it was the Comedy Network. They they had like a- that merged. One went out of business. They merged. I forget. Comedy Central was the winner, and I forget what the other one was called. It was and- the Comedy Network. It was or the Comedy Channel. I almost like those better than what it's become. You know, now obviously the Daily Show is fantastic. They've had some good shows. The Amy Schumer Show, but it's. When it's rough, like what you're talking about with whatever the Cartoon Network, because then the associated uh, Turner broadcast owned Boomerang used to air Top Cat and like late 50s fantastic cartoon shows, all the early Hanna-Barbera. And now that's stopped. That's all gone. You can't even. And that's what it was supposed to be. Well, a rep- the truth is, if you go to YouTube, you can see all those cartoons pretty much on YouTube now. Yeah, so I, The stuff I want to see was the stuff I used to watch in the early 60s on Captain Kangaroo. They used to have Mighty Mouse and Tom Terrific and all these, uh, you know, uh, but I grew up in L.A. Super Chicken. Yeah, Super Chicken was part of the uh, Bullwinkle, uh, whoever produced that. Super Chicken, George of the Jungle. But there's a, Jim Cornette and I share a love of, uh, this was an ABC Saturday afternoon. There were so many cartoons, if you, well, you're not as old as I am. Well, you'd be surprised. I, I caught all that stuff too. 64, 65, 63, 64, 65. The cartoons would start at seven in the morning. I actually had Captain Kangaroo for seven to eight. And then you had all these great cartoons, mostly Hanna-Barbera. But on ABC, the cartoons... Milton the Monster. That was like at three in the afternoon. So I the car- remember Milton the Monster. Seven, eight in the morning. Milton the Monster was, uh, those were, you know, brilliant. Uh, there was other great ones from uh, an outfit that uh, Howard Stern's dad uh, did some of the voices and production on Tennessee Tuxedo. That outfit, which also. The Don Adams yeah, vehicle, under- absolutely. Part of that same production team. So there are all these fantastic ones. There was Casper, the, I uh, forget who uh, did those, but the 60s Casper, those were pretty outstanding in that whole series. And all of them had comic book lines, you know, later on when Archie comics, I guess they had the Archie show in what was it, 72 or 73, and then all of the related spinoff shows for girls and young kids and blah, blah, blah. I mean, God, we had so many great ones, but I, you know, just moved back to SoCal after 40 years in the Bay Area, but I grew up in Southern Cal. And I think I've told you this, two of my childhood idols who emanated their shows globally out of L.A. were Soupy Sales. Well, actually, he started in New York and then he came to L.A. early 70s. And Paul Winchell, who had Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith, if you ever heard of those those were, that was a little bit before my time, but the uh, the cartoons they used to rerun a lot when I was younger. Same on the 
We had cartoon people, voiceover legends. Like I had June Foray on the show, and June Foray is the Mel Blanc of women. But one of my proudest shows, I brought Paul Winchell and Soupy Sales on together, even though Soupy Sales had throat cancer, but I had the two of them together. And I basically just let them talk and interview each other for an hour plus. But now, did you ever have the legend Paul Freeze? No, he, uh, he and Mel Blanc were like the ultimate gods. Paul Freeze. I have a little, I have a little trivia thing about Paul Freeze. Paul Freeze used to live in the same town that I lived in. He lived in Belvedere and I lived in Tiburon. And my brother used to deliver prescription drugs to Paul Freeze. They, he, he worked for a pharmacy, the, the Belvedere Pharmacy, and he used to deliver to Paul Freeze's house. Paul Freeze would never answer the door personally. He would never, ever answer the door, but he would, when my brother would buzz him, he said he would often answer the the uh, the doorbell, you know, and one of those uh, buzzer things. He would answer it just like Boris Badenov. Wow. Well, that's so so very... my brother knew it was him, but he could never. He never once met Paul Freeze, even though he delivered pharmaceuticals for him for months and months. So. Wait a minute. I'm going to call you on for people in Southern Cal. That would be like Tiburon Belvedere were the snootiest areas along with Hillsboro, the, the biggest money areas in a that's big. Where money. I grew up. Uh, very, I, grew up. It's I got the Beverly Hills. Nice. All of that area from Sausalito on up is wonderful, uh, but that would be like uh, Pacific Palisades down here, or any of the ritzy areas, Bel Air. You know, far more money than Beverly Hills itself, even. And that's although we've been priced out by uh, uh, Silicon Valley now. I mean, that's where the the highest rent stuff, like Atherton. You want you want really the big. We're we're still the poor yeah, neighborhood. Like I said, Burlingame, you know, which is north of uh, Cupertino and all the Silicon Valley. Burlingame is right next to the airport, literally right next to the airport. And it's funny. My aunt and uncle moved there, and my mom did not want to move to Burlingame because she said the airplane noise was too much. the The airport noise was too much. So we moved out to Marin, which was considered settling because. You had to go across the Golden Gate Bridge every day to get into work. And the, before the electronic toll was going on, that was a huge traffic choke point was the Golden Gate Bridge. It would push traffic. You, either way you go, you know, because I lived in the East Bay. I When I first moved up, I was living in the Fillmore, the black district, when I was going to dental school in San Francisco. And then I lived uh, when I got done with dental school i was living with a gal up in uh, the twin peaks which is, has the most magnificent view it's the highest point in san francisco yep. you uh you look so the radio at, towers are oh but you look down and you see the twinkling city and all that stuff but i miss that terribly as you and i were talking about i miss going into union square and seeing all my friends like the doorman at the Sir Francis Drake, tom Sweet. of course that's closed right now so you wouldn't be it's able to say hi to him anyway is the hotel closed? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were just talking about it in the news. They were just Why saying uh, COVID. And they, it was bought by a new ownership group that has balked on opening it back up because they're too afraid of taking an economic loss of staffing the place up and then having nobody show up there. I so took uh, Tom Sweeney to s some Cow Palace wrestling. Tom wore the Beef Eaters outfit at the famous Sir Francis Drake. It was, you know, an affordable place compared to the Fairmont or St. Francis or some of the snooty or expensive hotels. But this guy could remember, he had the most amazing, better than my memory, which people say is pretty damn good. But he, if, if some tourist stayed at the Sir Francis Drake a day or two and then came back three years later, he could remember, you know, first and last name. It was so impressive. Um, so I, I'm sure, you know, if I, was five years away from seeing him in person and called him up, you know, he it would be like nothing had changed. That's so that that pains me, you know, and I saw a lot of different things. Gumps, the last bastion of gumps. We used to have a gumps on Wilshire Boulevard in the Tony or Snooty town, of, you know, just outside of Beverly Hills and uh, on Wilshire Boulevard and that closed. So uh, a lot of stores and stuff. I don't even know if Neiman Marcus, which filed for bankruptcy, if they still have their store at the old city of Paris on what was it like? Gone. Gone. It closed? Yeah. Really? Yeah, what's, it is. what's in its place now? 
uh, boarded up signs and windows. So Union Square is depressing. Very, very. It's a lot it's, of homeless it, say, uh, people bitch. Uh, but, you know, we always saw homeless in what was called the South of Market District. But and then that store that took over FAO Schwartz, which I used to love to go in because I'm a big toy and action figure. Freak. I used to go to FAO Schwartz and Jeffries. Yeah, Jeffries was great. So they finally reopened it after it had closed for about four or five years. The Bastion store was on market and then they moved it to a tiny little thing uh, about five, four or five years ago. Is that second coming of Jeffrey's still open or is that gone too? I think it's still maybe around, I think, but, but by and large, we've got a difficult dichotomy in San Francisco. Nobody wants to be in downtown, but none of the downtown landlords want to lower their rent, you know? So they're driving everybody out and leaving these empty places and they won't rent it for for anything less than what they consider top dollar because they figure as soon as COVID ends, whenever that does, well, then they, that'll end because they don't they don't want to be caught in a lease that's one yeah. cent less than what they could have charged at the the height of the market. They, for those of you who don't know Union Square, it's like a mini Fifth Avenue of New York. There used we used to have a Rizzoli's of New York book and magazine store. We had. Uh, I, to I told you this story. I dragged Evan. Evan came out to stay with my, my wife and I. And uh, we go from the East Bay into San Francisco to the Virgin Megastore opening. And the opening event was going to be Cindy Lauper singing for free on the roof in the evening. So we went there purposely. I was told when she would be there during the day to do a sound check. And uh, you got to go I'll, uh, for a second. I'll keep talking. And uh, I said, Ev, we talking. Got... my wife just doesn't recognize when I'm on a podcast. Oh, yes, we're live globally, Mrs. Uh, Buddy Satella, live worldwide. So I said, let's go. And I went and purchased a micro cassette recorder. And we went in, I found Cindy Lauper and we interviewed her. We must have talked to her way over an hour, hour and 15 on wrestling, on Vince, Albano, Blassie, Piper. Wendy Richter, Mula, everything. And she was so accommodating. She talked about her ex, David Wolf, who got her interested in wrestling, about Hope, even before all that shenanigans, bodyguarding her at the Grammys. Bring her on this show. I'd love to interview Cindy Lauper. Somebody like that, but she's one of the nicest celebrities I've ever met. And believe you me, I mean, I when I was working and had my column at the Examiner, I would sweet talk him and say, hey, Elizabeth Taylor is uh, doing a public thing for her new perfume at Macy's. I want to go interview her or, I mean, I interviewed- Let's dig up Elizabeth Taylor and Brett get her on the show. Well, yeah, let's dig her up. Sarah Jessica Parker, um, who said blonde uh, singer, the Jessica Simpson, the bimbo girl when she had a new shoe line. Uh, even Rudy, this is a funny story. Rudy Giuliani was still off the wave of the 2001, you know, people actually liked this guy then. Yeah, America's quote unquote mayor, blah, blah, blah. My aunt and uncle named their dog after him. Uh, well, you should name a turd after him now, but yeah, exactly. But exactly. he was a nice guy. So he had a book signing at the, uh, the borders book place on, uh, right off Gary at the stock it was it Powell. And, um, he, uh, so Gavin Newsom is there, who uh, people where I'm living now in Southern Cal, which is Trump country. High school classmate of mine. I had math class with Gavin Newsom. And his, well, I met him first at my first wife's. No, I, no, I met him first. Between the two of us, oh, I uh, met him before well, you. Maybe, well, maybe. But I'm saying, I'm talking 1979 at my uh, ex-mother-in-law's. She was very politically oriented. She had three sons that were all political guys and then this daughter I was with and she had a dinner this is uh, at uh, at at her house I won't say her, her name she's passed the, my ex mother-in-law but uh, she was a huge political deal in the St. Francis uh, wood part of San Francisco you know as you go west towards the beach you know up uh, Market Street and down it and uh, it was a very nice neighborhood. Anyway, she had Judge Newsom, who was the father of Gavin, who brought Gavin, and I, f I think he's got a sister and his brother, uh, you know, and and Quentin Cop. I think I told you the story. Quentin Cop, yep. who's 
the biggest politician guys ever. Yeah, and, and I told you I roomed with his, uh, his, his son was my roommate in San Diego. Worst roommate I ever had. So it's been how, some player. How, the one thing I can say nice about Brad is wait, Gavin it's Newsom. Some player. Wait, Gavin Newsom was like big time Jesuit. Uh, what was it? Saint Ignatius, wasn't he? A Saint Ignatius guy. Yeah. Well, Gavin went to uh, 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 Redwood High School. Uh, okay, I thought he went to SI because no, I, I felt had math I, class with him. Had math class with him, so I know exactly where he went. Uh, did he have that goofy hair back then? The grease. Not hair. just the goofy hair, we actually voted him. Our class voted him not as most likely to succeed, <laughs> not as most likely to become a, a governor, but we, we not most political, we voted him as studliest jock and best hair. So oh. the, the hair got him over at the time. Remember, but, this his was hair when, was greased back then, was it? Yeah, well, this was the 80s where you had, you know, Flock of Seagulls was popular and Duran Duran was popular. And so everyone was into the, you know, super heavy gel and heavy mousse and, and all I, of that for their hairstyles. I didn't wear that stuff. But what my point was, so at the Rudy Giuliani thing, Gavin Newsom there, he wasn't mayor he definitely wasn't mayor yet i forget if he was just on the board of soups or something but he was you could tell he was being groomed and he was going to be part of the political machine so he's a democrat rudy republican but rudy was not the crazy nut job he is now in my opinion but gavin is there talking to him and i snapped some pictures of the two of them for the examiner and gavin begged me after the event was over he said please please don't print those pictures and ah. So, Interesting. That's that's crazy. That's so like, point in bringing that up, but that was the Borders bookstore at uh, Gary and Powell, where I introduced. I was friendly with the PR lady who booked the WWF guys when they were having books. Then, like for example, the Piper one that's very famous because uh, AJ, uh, what's his name, AJ Kirsch was still a fan then and he came to it sat front row so i was hired for all of roddy piper's west coast swings to do the warm-up for a half hour and do quizzes and stuff like that and then introduce him and then be the guy doing the questions so we had very quickly i thought well i'm going to really make this special for san francisco i brought in all of the icons of wrestling still alive my wife drove in Pen pepper gomez and kenji shibuya and woody farmer and I had the two mayors of Oakland and San Francisco at the time. The most prominent one was Willie well, Brown, San Francisco. They both the issued fix. keys to the city for Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, and a big proclamation plaque. So I had four pages in the examiner on this. That wasn't my point. But, it, you know, I also did that at some other ones like the... Uh, uh, there were uh, the other borders in Barnes and Noble where he did this thing with Piper, but that was my biggest thing. And I got the San Francisco bagpipe troupe, like 20 guys, all volunteer. They played in front of Piper, walked him, you know, down uh, up Powell Street into the building, into the elevator and out. And the place went crazy. It was like a WrestleMania entrance for him. He didn't know I was doing that until the last minute, but I had all these icons icons of san francisco like herb kane and carol dota for this thing and uh, it was a huge media event the lions were out the door i promoted the shit out of it so i also did triple h at the borders that was across the street from the new then pack bell park for the giants i got to do the same with him and then austin at the the union square the one where i did the piper thing and all big huge events and now you don't really see that they don't go on national uh, well, the WWE controls all of that. They, you know, they want it all to emulate from deal, it. because they they deal more with NBC properties now and, and kind of Fox. They're kind of out of the loop. They they don't no longer have the book deal with Simon and Schuster for their wrestlers. So you haven't seen. I can't even think other than Drew uh, McIntyre, Drew Galloway's new book. I forget who published that. That's like been the first wrestling book out of a wwe but, person I can yeah think. no i remember back in the day the wwe or the wwf used to just go to the regular press to try to publicize guys and one time i was called out by uh when i lived in sacramento i went and represented khtk which was uh 12 40 a.m um they sent me out because i was the the every day i used to call in 
as the grappler, and I would give wrestling reports to the uh, to the guy who was running the radio show, the sports show at the time, a guy named Ted Green. And so when Lex Luger came to Sacramento on the U.S. Express, do you remember he had that bus tour? And he had the feud um, Yokozuna. Yeah, before he fought Yokozuna, he drove across the United States and did stops everywhere. And Sacramento was one of his last stops. And I interviewed him there. And I've got to say, as an interviewer, I've done hundreds of interviews now, especially thanks to this show. I've never done a worse interview with somebody who cared less about being interviewed than Lex Luger. Well, he, it's not your fault. It kind of probably, he had the don't give a shit attitude. He was yeah. totally burned out. He just absolutely did not care about the U.S. Express. He'd been on that bus probably for about two weeks. Well, so, so what, you know. Did you interview him live at the studio? Yeah, yeah. And got nothing but yes or no answers. You know, mm -hmm. he was a watch checker that was like, you know, how much longer is this interview going to go? How much longer is this interview going to go? And I was like, I, I really didn't have anything to go with. I, I uh, The interview was only about five minutes had, long. You should have had me there. I, I got a... a let I should have. I was uh, about nine years away from having met you, so that that was still not possible for you me. You don't to even know this. Time. I was part of the writing and photography staff the entire run of WCW's Newsstand Magazine, but so I mean, I had access to folks, and then I was there the night that uh, Daphne Shannon debuted in 1999. Right. Many Mr. times. Soul. That's yeah. God rest her soul. She's a very sweet lady. I am very depressed that I heard from Impact Wrestling that uh, Kimber Lee, who's a fantastic wrestler, she was on Shimmer and Shine. A lot of people don't know what a, a big force. Uh, and she toured. I think she had at least a couple of tours in Japan and stuff. What happened to her? Uh, she admitted on Twitter that she felt suicidal. She's okay now. Oh, well, that's people, terrible. It's on Twitter. We're criticizing her weight. And can people stop doing that? We lost Hana Kimura to that. I'm sure social media did nothing uh, to boost the spirits of Shannon's so girl. sad. And, and this is a great talent. She's one of the top females. She is. I had no idea this was going on. And it's, that is terrible. We are seeing a lot of that stuff going on. And, and it even happens in pro sports. When, when Raheem Mostert for the San Francisco 49ers tore up his uh, uh, ACL and decided to have surgery instead of rehabbing it, not only were people calling in death threats to him, but people were then, his wife said, stop calling death threats into my husband. And then people turned around and started calling death threats into his wife. And I just, the, this whole bravado that people feel that, because they're on social, social media. Well, they're cowards because they're behind yes. keyboards for the most part. Like there've been people, I just say, well, all right, meet me at this time and place. I dare you to come to my face and say that shit. And they never show up. So that never was do. MO up north. People just have to let other people, you know, live their lives and not do that. So I'm going to try to reach out to Kimberly. But I mean, very nice person. At and the she's company. welcome to come on the show. You know, we give her whatever form she'd sure. want. I don't want to take advantage of her, but I just want to let her know that I just felt terrible. Really. Yeah, we support her. I support her, too. I, I feel terrible that she's... And I, I'm also a big fan of her work. So, you know, if she ever wanted to come on the and show... Now she's part of the... She is having to do the... Uh, uh, the Sue Young... She's part of that tribe, so she's wearing the makeup to look like Sue Young, and she's supposed to be possessed by the devil. That's her current character. Right. But I hope there will be more cross stuff. I should say one thing. I usually criticize Dave Marquez's quote unquote championship wrestling from Hollywood, which is like three hours north in a podunk town of Port Wainimi. But they've been airing shows. He's doing the same thing in Atlanta at the old Center Stage Theater where WCW did stuff uh, in the 90s. And they've had a terrific show. We were talking about Jonathan Gresham, Ring of Honor Pure Champion. He had a match with... Uh, uh, what's his face? Bennett, Maria Canales' husband, that was just off the charts, a close to five star on this. It was not. So it's they're showing it. If you see listed uh, championship wrestling from Hollywood on your UHF station or you can get it on a if you get direct TV and you get the sports channels like the New England sports channel, it's on Wednesday nights there. 
And that match was like 40 minutes long that they showed on TV, a few breaks, and it was incredible. It was a real wrestling, uh, just a lot of good Matt and Shane. In fact, it was completely in the ring. There was no outside the ring whatsoever. It was an wow. amazing, amazing match like the uh, APW Gym Wars. Uh, Tim Thatcher and who was the guy? It was like a headlock match. I think it was Jeff Cobb and, and Tim Thatcher. It was off the charts. And they were working headlocks uh, on each other. I think Jeff had Tim in a headlock for like 13 minutes, and he wouldn't break it. And it brought me back to Johnny Valentine's stuff in the, the 60s and 70s, that kind of great. See, you can still entertain fans with a headlock thing if you know what you're doing, if you're really a good worker. You know, and I get a little tired of people saying that the only thing that entertains people are high spots now. Yeah. And you can sell. It's kind of nonsensical. I love them as much. You know, it's impressive. The eight man on AEW Dynamite was off the charts. You know, the referee's not looking at like four guys uh, leading to the. Uh, the finish for the heels, all four heels in the ring on one guy instead. Of, the ref did nothing. And the ref is a friend of mine. I've known forever, Rick Knox from Pro Wrestling Guerrilla and all, a ton of indies in Southern Cal way before AEW, even way before the Young Bucks even started. So well, that's, AEW borrows, I think, more from the Lucha style than you do from the WWE. And in that sense, the Lucha style, I, I've talked there's to... There's a lot of stuff. There's European with Pac who was, uh, you know, very unhappy and left WWE. Yeah. So many, uh, so many others. Uh, here's, I want to say this about a recent, sure. before I forget, a recent WWE hiree in Mark Henry, which kind of shocked a lot of us. I thought he was uh, going to be a lifelong WWE Vince guy because he was doing a lot of positive community work there. Well, anyway, this week I was on Busted Open twice. This is the biggest radio station it's on. It's three hours of wrestling a day, six days a week on Sirius XM, and it's a, a very good show. Uh, the, Get me on the show. Well, that that might be impossible. They have just named guests from all the promotions. They'll have Billy Corgan on. They'll, they, I oh, was the name a long time ago. On every week, he does a half hour talking about you know promoting the two weekly shows. So it's amazing. But the guy that started, Dave LaGreca, has Bully Ray, Bubba Ray. Mark Henry and Tommy Dreamer, who's now indefinitely suspended from the show because of the dark side mess, which is upsetting. Uh, but we talked about that, and uh, he's still suspended from Impact Wrestling. We don't know when he's going to be back in the, the behind-the-scenes role, which is the most important part to him. People forget about his about what, what he anyway. after all. In the end, he actually didn't do anything. He said know, something. He just gave his opinion at the very end. He was fine up until... I know. I, I remember what he said. But in the end, it really wasn't the worst thing anyone's ever done. It's just yeah. more like this reaction that people want to punish somebody for the for The, the plane ride from observer now. kind of defended him. You know, that was the mentality of guys in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, that kind of colored it. So... I, I just feel very badly for Tommy, who is a super, super nice guy. Anytime I needed anything press-wise, ringside uh, credentials to shoot for ECW, I came in last minute to cover the Terry Funk tribute dinner, and Tommy got me all set up, and I was shooting and got, you know, he's a great guy. Super, super great guy. Anyway, so I was on Wednesday. I was asked to talk about Bruno Sammartino and George Ann Macropolis. George Ann Macropolis ran fan clubs starting in the late 50s for guys like Johnny Valentine's best friend, wrestler Chet Wallach. And then she moved to Buddy Rogers fan club and Bruno's fan club. Later in the 60s and 70s, she was the editor in like Wrestling World magazine every month of the fan club column. And the purpose of fan clubs, if you haven't read my history of the newsletters, the sheets, the dirt sheets, they were our dirt sheets of the 60s and 70s. And I uh, ran one for the Sheik, the original Sheik, Ed Farhut. And then I co-ran the Blassie fan club with John Arizzi when my boss in L.A. for the LaBelle promotion, Jeff Walton, had to give it up to become didn't, the Didn't uh, Gene LaBelle, isn't it his birthday today? I think I read somewhere. The uh, judo Gene LaBelle, who uh, I don't know, I hope he's doing great health-wise because I had him on at least 10 times on the show with Evan. A anyone who's a martial artist 
Oh, so Godfather, there. like he's a you know medalist in judo, taught Ronda Rousey, but he was the finesser. New Japan in the seventies would send guys over. Even the Baba did in the sixties for Gene to train and f- finesse and send back uh, guys like Bad News Alan Koaj before anybody heard of him. We're talking nineteen seventy. And granted, Bruce Lee gets all the credit for making karate popular in the United States. Bruno, uh, Gene was a big part of Bruce Lee's career. If you read, any a lot of, of people don't know that, and a lot of people don't know that that all the like stuntmen and guys that like Chuck Norris and Seagal and all that stuff got a lot of their early training from Gene well, LaBelle. Gene has had more stunt work credits too. So the judo guy, MMA guy, did pro wrestling. You know, many, many times, if you remember the masked lumberjack in a full red outfit, that was Judo Gene doing jobs. Later on, towards the bitter end of the LaBelle promotion, once I'd moved up to San Francisco, uh, Gene, uh, at the very end, was the last America's champion, our top title holder, our top strap. And uh, he was a heel against the newly turned babyface Peter Mavia. You know, that promotion just went down the toilet. I mean, at least we had Peter Mavia, but Gene LaBelle was not believable as a, a heel because he mostly when Mike LaBelle took over with his mom after his mom's husband. So that would make Cal Eaton, the stepfather, of judo Gene and Mike LaBelle and Mike LaBelle and Gene LaBelle hate each other. Gene, like most everybody hated Mike Gene. Everybody loved Gene. Most everybody, including the wrestlers disliked Mike because he shortchanged wrestlers at times on promises and money. But anyway, um, so uh, what was what was my so anyway that that's on Gene. But Gene also uh, helped get a lot of these guys. He helped allegedly get the gig on the Green Hornet for Bruce Lee. He helped uh, uh, Chuck Norris and so many other guys. I mean, Benny the. There's Chick- a great there's a great little story about Bruce Lee and uh, Burt Ward um uh on uh the green hornet and i don't know if you've ever heard this story but um uh uh burt ward you know was robin in in the batman i watched those shows live when they happened they were uh it was less than a half hour on wednesday and then they would conclude the next night thursday on abc so i watched all the batmans all the green hornets live i don't know if you've you've heard this story but but you know uh burt ward was saying you know i'm robin i'm 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 a tough dude, you know, I, 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 I work with Batman this whole time. And he was making fun of Bruce Lee and saying, you know, you're Cato, you're just the side guy, you know, you, you have to do everything that the, that the Green Hornet does. You can't do anything on your own. And Bruce Lee said, oh, I can do stuff on my own. I know how to do stuff on my own. And so, so Robin's like, oh, yeah, you really can fight? So he, he put, puts up his dukes. Bruce Lee apparently jumped up and kicked a light bulb that was dangling from the top of the ceiling and broke it with a kick. And apparently Burt Ward peed in his pants. And like, you know, because he was so afraid of what Bruce Lee would really do to him if he actually wanted to. And that was the end of Burt Ward ever claiming that his time as being Robin made him somewhat of a badass in real life. Look up the show. I brought Burt Ward on the show with Evan and I, but all he wanted to talk about was this new dog food line that he and his wife concocted. I thought he was kind of a blowhard. And whereas Bruce Lee was obviously the, the, the god of everything, uh, MMA wise, movie wise, and very soft spoken, respectful guy. Uh, never they made got- him look really bad in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and his uh, daughter sued them for that. For she has a book out. Shannon Lee has a. Uh, book at and, and wasn't that weird thing with the brother dying too his son that was in the crow the sting movie oh, his, yeah his son yeah his, his son dying because of the uh, uh suicide he committed suicide or whatever okay, let me get this back to busted open so okay uh, about bruno and george ann so george ann ran these fan clubs he then was the editor and she was the queen bee of of wrestling she was respected enough. She got comp seats at Madison Square Garden and WWF uh, TV tapings and stuff. So she could call people and talk in the office. So she was like that conduit that talked to the Marks, the smart fans, the wrestlers, and then the office stuff, also WCW. I mean, I was with her at fan convention stuff when like Shawn Michaels would call her or Scott Hall on her phone. 
before she passed, almost 10 years ago, uh, she passed. But anyway, at a weekend of champions convention, I shot all four of them, was asked to come out and shoot them. Uh, the first or the, the first one I went to in 91, Bruno and Buddy Rogers were there, mortal enemies, more so Bruno hating Buddy Rogers. And by this point, Bruno didn't know. I kept trying to tell him Buddy had mellowed out. But so Bruno, that wasn't that was that was a shoot. Those guys, were, that wasn't a work. Also, Bruno and Lou Thess. I can talk in another show because it would take me forever to talk about why Bruno disliked both guys. And I still consider Bruno to be the most ethical guy ever in the biz, which is why at the, when I was in a press box at WrestleMania in San Jose in 2015, I posed Bruno in the middle with Bret Hart and Ricky Steamboat on either end of him because I consider them to be, you know, the next lineage of ethical good guys in the biz behind the scenes. So Bruno, Bret, and Ricky is one of my best photos ever. So, uh, but that's saying something. She, yes. She, um, Nag Bruno to pose in a back room private area with Rogers for like 20 seconds. And then they both, they all split apart. And she had Bob Mulrin and a photographer friend of mine and George Napolitano take the shot. Anyway, she knew she was passing or she had it in her will. She wanted to be buried holding that very shot that he took. Of wow. Little of Bruno and Rogers. So I talked about that on Wednesday and busted open. So then Mark Henry on Friday Last Friday, just a couple of days ago, today being Sunday, the 10th of uh, October, if that's okay to say, they had they, Mark Henry is, they're talking, and he said that Jim Mitchell, who is really truly the Jackie Robinson for pro wrestling, even before Bo Brazil or Luther Lindsay, this guy in the early TV era, you know, late 40s, early 50s, was the guy. You know, other, another nickname for him was the Black Panther, but this guy could really go. He was a good mad and chain wrestler. He wasn't the hooker shooter quite that Luther Lindsay was, who gave Thez a run for his money. And Thez said he was one of the greatest he ever worked with, along with Carl Gotch. But Mark Henry said that uh, Jim Mitchell, this fantastic, I don't, you know, I can't say enough good things about this total legend, but he claimed that uh, Mark must have got some bad info. He claimed that Luther uh, drew over 50,000 at the L.A. Coliseum in the 50s. He couldn't even remember the opponent uh, at the Los Angeles Coliseum that configured for USC and UCLA football can hold over 110,000, 120, I think. And uh, that was not true. I knew right immediately. I go, that, that's bullshit. So I looked it up online. Of course, you know, I was right. The match that he was thinking about was Luthez against Baron Michelle Leone unifying the Los Angeles world title and the NWA title from the St. Louis office that Thez of course held. It was not even at the LA Coliseum, the outdoor Coliseum. It was Sports Arena? Play. It was at a field. Oh. Set it up. It drew a respectful 28,000 and a record gate of like $108,000. So 28,000 people, a little over that, which was a record for the U.S. at the time for pro wrestling, obviously many times broken. And then I said, so I told Mark, I go, I don't know where you got that info. I wish I had better news because, of course, Jim Mitchell's on my Mount Rushmore of African-American wrestling legends and blah, blah, blah. And um, and I said, the, the only wrestling show uh, actually at the real true L.A. Coliseum was August of, of 1971. Blassie Tolis, that fantastic grudge match, which followed the greatest wrestling angle I've ever seen that I think is far superior to Zabisco and Bruno, which is fantastic angle. And underneath that was the longest feud ever in pro wrestling, Boa Brazil against the Sheik. You had Neil Moskris against the original, the real El Solitario, who died. You know, he went to New Japan. He died in the, I don't know, I forget, sometime in the mid 70s or 77 or something. Uh, he was just incredible. And Gordman and Goliath in a heel-heel tag match against the greatest other heel tag team we had in L.A., Shibuya and Saito, and I'm talking Masa Saito. Pat Patterson in the opener against Paul DeMarco. So it was a stacked card. That drew at the outdoor L.A. Coliseum. It broke the Thez Baron Michelle Leone attendance record, close to 29,000. It broke the gate. And the only other time wrestling ever came to the L.A. Coliseum was just about a 
five weeks ago, six weeks ago, but at a cordoned off a small part of the Coliseum. So not the famous outdoor Coliseum, but it's like a, a building uh, part. And that was the new Japan show with the uh, AEW guys. And, you know, it was like a secondary New Japan show. They didn't send in too many big stars. But uh, you, you brought up a topic that I, I would like to diverge on to, and that is, what is your Mount Rushmore of African-American wrestling? Well, I, don't, I don't like answering that because I like to look at the, the history part. Uh, okay. Uh, because, so the first guy who had to brave a lot of racism and stuff, so it's kind of my Mount Rushmore. But that has to be Jim Mitchell, who... You know, but then the next tier would be uh, in. Uh, and so I'm not talking just four guys. Luther Lindsay, who was a hooker shooter, the Black Luthers, uh, and this guy could really go. He was in the you know that upper echelon with Billy Robinson, Gotch, Bill Miller, Stu Hart, Thez, Gagne, uh, Bert Asaridi in England. So Jim Mitchell, then. Uh, Luther Lindsay, and then the performing guys. I'm going to start with Bobo Brazil, who main evented. He was pretty much wherever he went. I never got to see any of his matches, his oh. stuff, and it's hard to find any of his work on YouTube. No, there's not a, a lot, but I mean, he would go and main event against Baba in Japan, Sakaguchi over there, uh, even before Inoki and Baba split away from uh, Japan Pro to form their own two respective groups in December 72. But WWE never mentions Bobo Brazil, ever. Well, he, uh, they even gave him like a, uh, like they gave Blassie in 72 against Morales, the Pacific Coast title, which he never held. You know, he had already lost the America's Championship, which he held a couple of times and stuff, but uh, they also gave Bobo like some title for like a month, you know, when he was towards the end of his retirement, he would wrestle on tri WF shows, you know, sometimes undercard occasionally like Baltimore teaming with Bruno San Martino. But, uh, let's get back to that. So the late fifties, early sixties at Madison square garden. So this troop of superb African-American stars started at the very top Bobo, who was a champion in many places, particularly Detroit as the United States champion. Uh, Dory Dixon, who is still a Lucha commissioner because he, uh, I think he was from Jamaica and he spoke Spanish. This guy toured all over the world. Sweet Daddy Siki and Sailor R. Thomas, the four of them would main event in Chicago for Fred Kohler and then for Vince Sr. and the Gold Dust Trio at Madison Square Garden and all of those capital sports promotions, which later became Tri-WF and WWF and WWE. But then we go from that lineage, and they were there taking on the whole Buddy Rogers troupe, but Billy Darnell, Magnificent Maurice, Handsome Johnny Barron. And so after that group, so each generation had a Mount Rushmore. Then we go into a, a wide, long area. Earl Maynard, who would later hold tag titles in particularly in LA with Bobo and Rocky Johnson, but Earl Maynard. He was Mr. USA, right? Mr. Universe. He was a Mr. Universe. Mr. Universe from uh, the Bahamas. And I still keep in touch with him. I He's had him still in good shape. I've seen pictures of him. Yeah. He's still in really good shape. Guy, he was always upper tier. He was one of the few that would come up from LA and Roy Shire would, you know, really kick him up to, <laughs> decent matches, you know, maybe the third from the bottom or excuse me, third from the top and stuff. So Earl Maynard, he was at, he wrestled on tri WF shows uh, for 1963, way before Rocky Johnson didn't even come in there until I think 82. Uh, so I would also, I would include Bearcat Wright definitely. So Bobo and Bearcat Wright were the very first for a real true big time group uh, in WWA Los Angeles. That was the home base for that world title from about 59, 60 through 1967 when Bobo had a unification match uh, with Gene Kaniski, the NWA champion. And they morphed, it was a Broadway, a draw. They morphed the WWA title into the NWA. But that end, uh, WWA title that Bearcat Wright and Bobo held as the first black world champions anywhere was defended in San Francisco, Honolulu, sometimes Oregon, and a ton of times in Japan because, of course, Blassie and Destroyer, Dick Byer, would drop it to Ricky Dozan. So that was, you know, prestigious title way before Ron Simmons, who was more the modern day 
He would be on my Mount Rushmore. Wasn't first. Ron Simmons, incredible guy, incredible friend, all of that. Butch Reed was absolutely incredible. After Tony Atlas left Georgia Championship, they tried to make Butch Reed the new Tony Atlas. And Tony Atlas was an incredible, amazing baby face then. He could really go with the matches with Flair and Ole Anderson and Ivan Koloff. He was really, that was his peak for me, not WWF. But Tony Atlas never held an individual title. Oh, yeah, in he WWF. held titles. He held the uh, national title for... No, I mean in the WWF, when he was in yeah. the WWF. Well, but the tag titles with Rocky, he held his... Right, that's what I said. But as an individual, oh, he never... It's in Mid-Atlantic uh, as a singles, and he held the, um, whatever it was called, the national title for... Right, Oli but those were all NWA or WCW-based. Yeah, he never... Those, t those titles mean more to me than the bullshit WWF titles. But there has been many great Shag Thomas. I think people forget about Woody Strode, who was half of the time a movie star. He was in Spartacus with, uh, in that battle scene with Kirk Douglas. He was a world champion, uh, not a world champion, but he held many regional titles, a huge star in L.A. He was also one of the first uh, black cowboys. This guy was, uh, I used to see him every year until he passed the Cauliflower Alley. And this guy was friggin' amazing and a great wrestler. So he's in my Black Hall of Fame, which is far more than just the Mount Rushmore four guys. There's so many great uh, black wrestlers. There's that one that Stu Hart trained that died in Europe. He unfortunately was on uh, Juiced. I can't think of his name, but he had a huge chest. This guy was an incredible athlete. It's a shame that, you know, he felt like he had to do that stuff to be big because he could really go as a wrestler. He was coming, reminded me a lot of uh, another friend of mine, Gary Albright, who was married to. Oh, know, Gary Albright's one of my all time favorite wrestlers and probably, probably the most unrecognized for, well, let's just put it this way. If there was a real fight and it was a real shoot fight, I he could kick your ass. He was such Gary a Albright is one guy I would never Where want. You see him? Where did you see him in all Japan or his uh, UWF, the worked shoot stuff? The I UWF. was a fan of his in college. I was a fan of his when he was a college wrestler. I thought when he came into, I was following him from the college days. And I was thinking when he finally does get into the pros, he's going to be a wrestler that nobody has ever seen before. That He's going to be a guy that's going to put the world on its heels. And he did in Japan, but he never really got over in the United States. And I was always disappointed yeah, by that. A shame. Uh, it, it, he was more like a guy who should have spent time up uh, with Stu Hart. So if anybody can think of that African-American Amer African wrestler, I think that Stu and Boris Malenko. All I can think of is Ahmed Johnson, and I know that's not it. Uh, no, no. Uh, Tony Ahmed, that's Tony Norris from uh, Dallas. When the yeah, he, he yeah he was. You know, when you say steroids and big chest, that's the first thing. I, the only one I can think of off the top of my head, and I know it's not him. Definitely include Rocky Johnson, who was one of the most exciting wrestlers. I shot him in L.A. a ton of times. As I said, he had matches with everybody. A heel, Fred Blassie. He helped turn Fred Blassie face in 1970. And then Fred had the three heel heel match series with the Sheik, and finally turned. Do you consider The Rock to be a, a black wrestler? Yeah, yeah. Because some he's, people say he's Polynesian. He's one of my favorite. Um, that was the thing Mark Henry asked me. Okay, so who's your top entertainer in pro wrestling? And I said, well, Buddy Rogers and Gorgeous George. But The Rock is up there too. You know how entertaining was him? He never did. Anything that wasn't less, you know, once he got going, you know, when they took away the Rocky Maivia shit, he really got going and was... And he got out of the nation of domination. Oh, that was, was great. Well, even when he was in the nation, the promos were great. The All the stuff he did with Triple H, with Austin, all of it was awesome. So, yeah, he's, he's up there, but... Uh, there, there's so many other wrestlers from different cultures. You know, we want to talk India. We talk about Dama and... and uh, uh, Gara Singh, uh, uh, these are old timers, and yeah. the Japanese, true Japanese wrestlers. I mean, there's just about a billion, uh, and that's why I like seeing Zaya Lee. We've never seen real, true Chinese wrestlers. We've had some Philippine wrestlers who were billed as being from Japan. Ray Urbano, who was both the original Kabuki, not the great Kabuki, the all Japan one that we saw in Georgia and Dallas. He did it like in the late 60s, early 70s in Detroit with face paint. 
and he was also Tokyo Tom, but he was Philippine person. You know, it's like Nikolai Volkov, who played a Russian. He was, uh, I think, Romanian, as is uh, uh, what's Rousseff. his Rousseff, who's I forget his name. Uh, I shouldn't forget his name in AEW now. That guy, Mir- Bulgaria. So. Anyway, I've got to go, Russ. Uh, uh, I want to make sure Evan knows that we're expecting him next week to start promoting his book. We want to get that book hype touring and want to get Evan's take on everything and see if Evan's been watching AEW and Impact. And- sure, it's been a while. We, we do have a lot to catch up with him on. So I appreciate and- you being here this I week. I watch the end of, of Heels. I'm into, it's the very last episode. I hope this show returns. Uh, and uh, you tell me if the uh, the old fart heel that's in the three-way match does not remind you of an amalgamation of Michael Hayes at his sleaziest in like the year 2002 and Ric Flair with the showing of his privates on the airplane. It is funny. They even referenced tonight, I've only watched the first 10 minutes of it, they referenced uh, both Dark Side and then Ric Flair on 30 on 30 on ESPN. Really? It, wow. It, 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 it must watch... Uh, last episode. I watch no all spoilers because I am eventually going to watch the whole series. I'm gonna once this is the final episode and that's done. My bro- my brother and I is get, my brother's gonna come over. We're gonna binge watch the whole thing. Well, we're on. You, we're only on episode four. Look in the photo credits because most every one of them this season, with the exception of the plane ride from hell, which I was not on, or the. Uh, no, I meant uh, heels. I meant heels. We're gonna. I'm gonna wait till the end. Last yeah. episode of I heels. Thought- also look at the photo credits of Dark Side of the Ring on uh, uh, Vice Channel because I'm in all the photo credits. I know I've got a ton because they paid me. I hope I get the credit too in the credits. That doesn't always happen. Yeah, I'm though. glad you're getting paid because a lot of times that doesn't happen. So I'm glad they're paying you. Look at the Sean episode is this week. It should be, you know, oh, terrific. It was that's going to be heartbreaking. I love doing that. Yeah, she was a sweetie. Very, I mean, I knew her from the Florida days, and yeah, she had her difficulties, but there were a lot of fun times with her at Joel Goodhart's TWA, with her and Mick Foley in the car, with Medusa and Eddie Gilbert. Sometimes and had- those episodes are hard to see because it actually does make me tear up to yeah, it, know what we lost in some of these people. I don't know how they can mine that. It's good that they have some fun ones like FMW and XPW. At least those are fun. It doesn't end with the person dying and, and horrific stuff like the crime Johnny Canine stuff. That was pretty horrific. But look for Lance Storm, some great commentary from him and Scott Damore and Cornette on, on that one. They're, they're worth seeing. They all are. Very it's- good. Well, it's great to have you again this week. Sorry we couldn't get all the guests lined up, but we're going to have hopefully Evan next week. I'm trying to line up a couple other guys from NorCal, and 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 we'll see if we can have some additional guests well, coming well, on. Yeah, let's, let's have a backup, maybe one. But let's make sure Evan... Evan, we want you back on. We will hopefully see him next week. Everybody, combate Kurasai. Domori kato gozaimashite. And uh, we will. What he said. What he said. All right, folks. We'll see you all next week. Thanks. Good night.